Well, thank you, Brother Danny, for that song. It is my favorite. There you are. Look for you. If since I heard you sing it the first time, and that was the first time I ever heard it, was here. I grew up in a little country Baptist church that sang out of Stamps Baxter hymnals, and we didn't sing some of the, some of the old Reformation hymns. And, and uh, I'd never heard that song until one of the camp meetings here. Brother Danny sang that. And the words to the chorus so captivated my heart that I've never gotten over it. I need no other argument. I need no other plea. The only thing I need to be reminded of is that Jesus died and that he died for me, and that keeps me motivated, keeps me motivated. I'm suspect of people always have to be motivated, aren't you? Always got to be pushed and prompted and begged and pleaded. Well, I'll tell you, the Bible doesn't teach that kind of Christianity, I don't believe. And so I'm thankful that Jesus died and that his death is enough to motivate the true children of God to go on for him. Thank the Lord for the other music tonight. Hold to God's unchanging hand. I love that arrangement of it. Wasn't that beautiful? Great song, great song. And all the congregational singing. All right, let's have a word of prayer together. And then we're going to go to the Bible. Father, I ask your Holy Spirit to so take charge of this time of preaching that not one thing would be said that would dishonor Jesus, that all of it would be uh, orchestrated together to bring the greatest possible glory to him. Lord, if I know my heart, and I know sometimes our hearts can deceive us, but if I know anything about my heart tonight, Lord, my greatest desire is that Jesus receive the maximum magnification possible. Whatever has to happen for Jesus to get greatest glory, Lord, that's what I pray for. And I ask you to give guidance and direction to the preaching of the Word of God, that it may be as the Word says it will be, that it may be quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. And we'll praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you have a copy of the Bible, I want you to turn with me to the book of Acts chapter 2. And we want to read a few verses of Scripture together. Acts, the second chapter. We'll begin reading in verse 41 and read through the end of the chapter. Now, revival is nothing more or less than the restoration of a church to the standard of normalcy presented in the Word for the church. Revival is not extracurricular. Revival is not anything weird or unusual or strange or different. Revival is simply the church operating according to the standard of the Bible. The need of revival is testified when the church is less than the Bible says it ought to be. And the experience of revival is simply the living out of the standard of the Word of God. Now, we tend to think of revival as something weird, fanatical, strange, different, but it's not. It's just the church being the church. It's just the church living the New Testament norm. I mentioned Havner's statement this morning. We've been subnormal for so long. If we ever get normal, we'll appear to be abnormal. And that's, a, that's exactly the truth. You find a church that's living even approximating the standard of the Word of God and most of the other churches in the association won't have anything to do with it. They'll call it strange and weird and extremist and fanatical and, and uh, then, of course, that ultimate horrible word, charismatic, gets applied. Because the, 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 the average church is uncomfortable around a normal church. See, the average is not normal in the 20th century. The average church is not the normal church. So I want us to see together for a little while what the normal church is to be. Now, just to tie it together with the morning half of the text, let me say to you that the only evident sign of salvation given in the New Testament, the only evident sign of salvation given in the New Testament is obedience to the will of God. That's the only thing the Bible presents as the qualifying mark, as the identifying characteristic of a true convert. Obedience to the will of God, a lifestyle of obedience. Doesn't mean that we will never fail, doesn't mean that we'll never blow it, but it does mean we don't stay there if we've been converted. The, the habit of life, the standard of living is obedience. You know what Jesus said in Matthew 7? He said, you shall know them by their fruits. Warning false teachers, you will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, and every corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. 
the consistency of lifestyle. And Jesus identified what he was talking about when he mentioned fruit in verse 21 when he said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father who is in heaven. That's the identifying mark of the Christian, of the saved person. And that's what we saw this morning about this crowd. Verse 41 says, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. They took that initial step of obedience. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly. This group of converts, notice, not some of them, not most of them, but all of them continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Now that's where we ended this morning, dealing with the, with the uh, constituents of the New Testament church. Tonight I want to look at the second half of the text, and I call it the climate of a New Testament church. The climate of a New Testament church. And by climate, I mean the atmosphere of the church. Every church local has a noticeable atmosphere, a feel about it, if you please. And if you've done much preaching, if you've been in many churches, done any revival work or visited many revivals, pretty soon you can identify a great deal about a church without anything being said or done because of the atmosphere that you can sense by the Holy Spirit, that sensitivity to the climate. This church in Jerusalem, this first century church, had a certain kind of an atmosphere. When someone walked into that fellowship, they sensed some things. There were some things that were evident and obvious about that congregation that set them apart, and it set the standard, literally, it set the standard for the, for the measurement of every church in every generation from that time to this. It's the standard by which we're to measure ourselves tonight. Now, these verses tell us, what, uh, what the atmosphere of the church ought to be, what the climate of the church ought to be. And if it's not this, then we're in need of revival. Revelation chapter 2, Jesus spoke to the church at Ephesus, and he said, I know your works. And he listed that which they were commemorated to be commemorated for. And he said, you have, you have uh, uh, tried false prophets. Boy, you've got doctrinal integrity. You know the doctrines of the faith, and you stand on them. And he talked about their labor and their patience and so forth. And then he said, nevertheless, I have somewhat against you because you've left your first love. And he said, if you don't repent and do the first works, I'll come to you quickly and remove your candlestick. The old country preacher said he'll blow your light out. He'll blow your light out. Why? If you don't go back to the first... Now, he was talking to the church at Ephesus, but I believe there's a sense in which that verse can be applied to any church, to this church, in relation to going back to the first works of the church. If this church doesn't go back to the standard of the first church, there can come a day when Jesus says, you've forfeited your right to be called a church. I'll remove the candlestick from you. I believe it's that serious tonight. I believe it's that sobering tonight to see what God says we ought to be if we're not not that we better find out why and start working on fixing it amen there'll come a day when he'll remove the candlestick now the atmosphere of the local church is determined by the attitudes of the individual members as the individual members go so goes the church the church does not exist collectively it is the addition of individuals together if the atmosphere of the church is improper the attitude of the individuals he is rebellion. The church-wide climate is always a reflection of the individual commitments of the Christians. Now, Acts chapter 2 tells us what our individual spiritual condition should be and what the atmospheric climate of the church will be when our individual commitments are what they ought to be. Now, I want to say this, and we're going to get to the text, but I, want to say, I wanted to say these two or three introductory things that the Lord spoke to me about this afternoon. Number one, let me say this. This is not how we are to act. This is how, what we are to be. There's a difference. Now, we can read these verses and try to imitate and pretend and put on a front, but that's not the issue. That's what we've been doing too long, see. We get in a red-hot meeting or a Bible conference and we'll, start, we'll hear what we ought to be and we'll try to pretend that for a while. We'll play act. We'll put on the front. We don't need to act this way. We need to be this way. 
And that's where we place our heart in such yieldedness before the God who made all things that the Holy Ghost is free to do a work of creation in us, to create the right attitudes, to create a clean heart and a, renew a right spirit within us. So this is how we're to be, not how we're to act. And let me say this, and we're going to get to the text. The first step in having a revival is recognizing the absence of revival. If I'm not willing to admit I'm not where I ought to be, I'll never get where I ought to be. The first step, I've been thinking about a verse, and I wanted to preach on it. Maybe I will before the week's over. Isaiah 44 and 3. I will pour water upon him that's thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. When we had our prayer meeting, Brother Jimmy prayed that verse and prayed about that verse. And, and it's been on my mind for two or three days. The first thing a thirsty man does is realize something essential is missing. Water in the physical realm, the manifestation of God in the spiritual. There's a book on shelves in bookstores all over the nation written by John MacArthur. It's a good book entitled Our Sufficiency in Christ. If I had the mind for it and the time to do it, I'd like to write another book to be an addendum. Our deficiency in experience. Yes, our sufficiency is in Christ, but the fact of the matter is our experience of Jesus is deficient in many realms. There is a need. Now listen to me. Our greatest need tonight is to see our need. Our greatest need is to see our need. As long as we don't see that we have a need, we'll tiptoe through the tulips and we'll play church games and we'll press in and press out and nothing will ever happen and nobody will ever get saved and we'll be just as happy as a pig in the sunshine. But when we begin to see there's a need and it's a real need and it's a desperate need, we'll become so broken that we won't get off the altar, we won't get off our face until Acts chapter 2 gets up off the page of the Bible and walks in our church house and sits down in the pew and feels at home. Acts 2 verse 43 says, And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common. And they sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. There are five elements that identify the climate of the New Testament church. Not only this New Testament church, but anyone that measures up to the standard of the Bible. Now, of course, you know this. You don't go to church. You are the church. This building is not the church. Mildale Church is not a building. Mildale Church is the membership that know Christ and have been baptized by the Holy Ghost into his body. You are the church. And so this is how you're to be, how I'm to be. I make my church what it ought to be. So let's see. First of all, there was an element of seriousness in the church, a serious element. Verse 43 says, And fear came upon every soul. The New American Standard Bible translates it like this. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe. And that's pretty much the idea. That waters it down a little bit more than I like because the idea of the fear of God is more than simply reverencing Him and awing Him. The idea of fearing God, and that's what characterized that church, the, the fear of the Lord was upon that congregation. And that doesn't mean the paralyzing, mind-numbing kind of terror that a child feels toward the things that go bump in the night. It's not fear of a despotic ruler, but it's the reverence that a child feels toward a parent that makes them want to please and, and makes them want to do what is acceptable, realizing even as they're doing it that there's a consequence to disobedience. That's the idea behind this word fear, to, to live in the light of the awesome holiness of God, to, to have a sense of seriousness that, that settles in on the congregation. This means simply that that church in Jerusalem saw God for who he really is. And because of that, there was, there was a sober-mindedness and a seriousness about serving him and pleasing him. Proverbs 16 and 6, the Bible says, By the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. Whenever you find evil tolerated in a Christian's life or in a church's life, you'll find an absence of the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord drives evil away. When I take God seriously, I take sin seriously. If I'm not taking sin seriously, I'm not taking God seriously. Hebrews 12 just let me give you a few verses. Hebrews 12, 
Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. 1 Peter 1, 17. If you have called upon the Father who without respect of persons judges according to every man's work, spend the time of your sojourning here in fear. Time and again, the Bible calls for the fear of God to be upon his people. And I believe tonight that one of the things that ought to be evident to anybody who walks into our fellowship, one of the things that ought to strike them and one of the things you ought to be able to pick up on by being around us is that there's a deep, awesome reverence for who God is and what God wants. The will of God is treated with great seriousness. The Word of God is handled with great sobriety of heart. Too many modern churches, and I put it in quotation marks, have replaced fear with frivolity. Awe has been replaced with entertainment. Seriousness has been swapped for silliness. Until Romans 3.18 can barely be said. The Bible says there is no fear of God before their eyes. The psalmist said we're to serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Now, not only was there a serious element, but there was a supernatural element in that church. Verse 43 says, And many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. Let me ask you this tonight. Is God doing anything supernatural in your life, in your congregation? Anything supernatural? Anything happening in your home or in your family or in your church that demands a supernatural explanation? Now, you can take this too far, and many folks have, but the principle remains valid and biblical. If God is a supernatural God, and He is, who still works miracles, and He does, then His church ought to be experiencing some things that defy human explanation, that puzzle the world. Our God is not impotent tonight. He is omnipotent. All power in heaven and in earth rest in the hands of Jesus. And the Bible says God's hand is not shortened that he cannot save. His ear is not heavy that he cannot hear. But our iniquities have separated between us and our God. If everything happening in your life and your church family can be explained on the natural level, then something is wrong with your relationship to the supernatural God of the Bible. James chapter 5. Now, James is the, Bi is the book of the Bible that many folk are uncomfortable with for several reasons, not the least of which is James 5, where the Bible talks about praying over the sick and seeing them get well. And the Bible says in the same context that Elijah was a man of like passions, like you and me. He was a man like me, a man like you. And yet he prayed earnestly that it wouldn't rain. And for the space of three and a half years, not a drop fell in Judea. And at the end of that time, he prayed again and rain came. We say Elijah was a prophet. I mean, sure, he could do that. But what about me? I can't do it. The Bible says you need to understand Elijah had the same struggles you've got. He had the same fear of failure you have. He had the same unbelief warring against him that you've got. And yet God did the supernatural. If there was ever a time God did supernatural things, this is a time when God wants to do supernatural things. And I believe a New Testament church that's walking with Jesus is one that will be seeing God do the unexplainable in our midst. Physical, physical things. Physical things happening can't be explained outside of the power of God. Spiritual things, people being delivered from spiritual bondage. Mental things, mental things happening. People being set free from mental traps and mental diseases and mental illnesses. I believe emotional things can happen, emotional healing. I believe financial things ought to be happening in the church. And when those things are missing, we need to find out why. Instead of sitting on the premises, we ought to be standing on the promises. Amen. The Bible says in Jesus, all the promises of God are yea and amen. When we began to take 
God at His Word and operate by faith on the level of the supernatural whenever financial crisis comes instead of trying to figure out how to handle the budget we go to Jesus and find out what he's got in mind when physical things come against us we find out what Jesus is up to give the supernatural God of the Bible a chance to do the supernatural in our life the miraculous ought to be routine and the unusual ought to be normal in the church that walks with Christ Acts chapter 2 says that in the true church, in the, New, in the New Testament church, there was a serious element. Fear was on every soul. There was a supernatural element. Wonders and signs were being done. Things that couldn't be explained on the naturally human level. Then there's a third element. There was a selfless element. A selfless element in that church. One of the things that people noticed who hang, hung around that group of believers was the selflessness with which they lived. Verse 44 says, And all that believed were together and had all things common. And they sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. In that New Testament church, that, there was an atmosphere of generosity in the body of Christ because these people surrendered even their material goods to the Lordship of Jesus. I believe one of the things that always identifies revival is a spirit of giving. It's one of the things that always characterizes its selflessness. In fact, uh, one of the indicators, one of the prime indicators of your relationship with the Lord Jesus is how you handle financial matters. Self-centered or Christ-centered? Do you run it or does Jesus run it? You say you're just looking for a big offering. I hope you've got a flat tire and you go outside. I'll be willing to put my checkbook with yours and, and look at it. I'm not telling you to do something I don't believe in doing myself. It is impossible, it is impossible to understand New Testament Christianity apart from the principles of selfless giving. That's the very essence of the Spirit of Christ. The Bible says he was rich, but he became poor for your sakes, that you through his poverty might be made rich. And that's what the Bible has to say about the first century church. When people came to that church, one of the things they noticed is that there was no need that went unmet. No need went unmet, and they didn't have to have government agencies to do it. The church took care of their own. Paul later wrote about it in this way. He said, here's God's system, that when one has a lack, the one who has the surplus meets the need. And then somewhere down the line, the old boy who used to have the surplus, he'll have a need. And that guy whom he ministered to will rise up to him and minister his surplus. So that there's an equality, the Bible says. That's the idea. That's the idea of these verses. They had all things common. They didn't talk about mine, 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 mine. It was all Christ's. And we're his body, and we use it for one another to minister in the way that God leads. And then there was a fourth element. There was a stimulating element in that church. A stimulating element. Say, so what do you mean by stimulating? Verse 46, the Bible says, And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. Now this is the balance to the fear. The fear of the Lord alone, if the element of seriousness is left unchecked and unbalanced, the church becomes dry and sterile and high church and formal, all in the name of being reverential. And so the balance comes with the thrill and the delight and the gladness and the praise and the joy. You see, you can be in, in excited and still be reverencing God. And so this church, though they had that element of reverence, also had a, uh, an element of stimulation about them. When, when you came to that group, when you visited in that congregation, you saw a unity and you saw an excitement. They were stimulated and stimulating to be around. They enjoyed being together. They took every opportunity to get together in fellowship. And they just loved each other. And they were enthused in their worship of the Lord. They didn't dread coming together. They delighted in it. Assembling themselves together was a joy for those folk. They praised God and they shared with one another. They believed the psalmist who said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Most folk in our day would have to rewrite that verse and say, I was glum or I was grumpy or I was gloomy. But the psalmist said, I was glad. I'd been sitting on go all day on pins and needles waiting for time to get together with a family and celebrate Jesus. Let me tell you something, folk. A genuine New Testament church is an exciting place to be. Did you hear what I said? A New Testament church is an exciting place to be. 
A boring church is a backslidden church. And a bored Christian is a backslidden Christian. Bored is backslidden. You say, well, you know, I'm just, uh, I'm not the excitable kind. Liar. You're excitable about what you love. Whatever you love, you get excited about. That's always true. I'm not, I'm not generally a very excitable person. I'm not, I'm not generally a very excitable person. I came from a Methodist background. Brother Danny, you singing that song, and I just, it just stirs my heart and blesses my heart. And I thought, boy, uh, even, even, old, even old cold Methodists get excited about that. I grew up in a Methodist church, dead as a hammer. And that's my, that's my religious background. Nobody ever said amen in my church. Nobody ever shouted in the church that I grew up in. And my personality is basically one of reticence, and, and, and I'm, I'm pretty much withdrawn. I don't meet people easily. I'm not one of these exuberant, bubbling over kind of people. But I'll tell you, when I get around my little baby Samuel's son, all of a sudden I can get excited and thrilled, and I'll be making sounds I'd never make as a dignified grown man. I love him. I love him. And, and today I woke up from my nap. First thing came to my mind was a picture of Samuel as he smiles when he wakes up from his sleep. Brother, I'll tell you, when I love something, I can get thrilled about it. I can get thrilled. I'm a sports fan. I'm a fight fan. I love boxing. I love the arena. I watched Mike Tyson get his block knocked off. I was screaming like a banshee Indian the night it happened. I'd wanted that guy to get dusted off for so long. I was glad to see it happen. I was thrilled. I was delighted. And what I love, I can get excited about. And when I love Jesus, I can get excited about Him. And if I can't get excited about Him, I don't love Him as I ought to. I've left my first love. Folk, I am convinced with all of my heart the most exciting place in Zachary, Louisiana ought not be the honky-tonk and the beer joint. It ought to be the place where Jesus is celebrated and glorified. That ought to be where real joy is found. And when that crowd comes from the beer hall and the honky-tonk into our churches, they ought to say, that's what I've been looking for. That's the real, authentic joy I've been searching for. Not the counterfeit that has to be drugged up and drank up, but the real thing that bubbles from the inside. That ought to be one of the signs of the New Testament church. And when that's missing, something is seriously wrong. Seriously wrong. The word gladness in our text means exuberant, explosive joy. 1 Peter 1.8 uses it when it says joy unspeakable and full of glory. Now, you say, well, uh, what, do, what do we do? Well, I believe before the joy comes, there's got to be some weeping. And that's repentance over the fact that it's not here and looking for it. God's church is to be a place of warmth and life, not coldness and deadness. God's church ought to be a place of grace and glory, not dullness and drudgery. May God deliver us from this paralyzing numbness, this nauseating indifference that threatens to overwhelm us in this Laodicean age. We need to seek God for the restoration of an excitement and an aliveness in Christ. I'm not talking about an artificial kind of hype. Anybody can hype it up. I was watching the Democratic and Republican conventions. Any fool can work up a good meeting. All you got to do is the right kind of speakers and get a few banners for folks to wave and play some moving marching anthems and anybody can hype it up and promote it up and pump it up. I'm not talking about something's got to be pumped up from the outside. I'm not talking about us coming to church having to be pumped up and worked up. I'm talking about walking with Jesus in such a commitment and such a lifestyle of yielding that it's bubbling over from the inside and just splashes on everybody we get around. Gladness and praising God and singleness of heart and all the people favored that. The people said there's something favorable about that. That's an exciting place to be. By the way, one of the great things that always marks the coming of revival is restoring joy to the Christian. The Bible says, create in me a new heart, renew a right spirit within me, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. The psalmist said, Wilt thou not revive us again? Why? That thy people may rejoice in thee. Nehemiah said, The joy of the Lord is your strength. Ephesians 5 says, 
Be filled with the Spirit. And when you do, you'll be speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 14, 17 says, The kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. So that New Testament church had a stimulating element. And lastly, that New Testament church had a soul winning element. Verse 47 says, And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. The Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved in the original language. That church had a contagious faith. They regularly, in fact, the Bible says daily, they saw other folks saved and converted and added to the congregation. The Bible says the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. Now you'll notice how the verse is worded. The Bible says the Lord added. The Lord added. Who adds to the church? Who converts people? Who brings them into the family? The Lord does. We can't do that. I can't add to the church. I can force somebody or coerce someone to join this church, but I can't add them to the church. Only the Lord can do that. Back in that earlier verse when the Bible says that 3,000 were baptized and added to the church, God had done that. God brought conviction. God converted them. And if it hadn't been for the Lord, they wouldn't have been saved. Not a one of them had gotten in or been added to the church. You're here tonight. You're in the church because the Lord added you now. You, you say, preacher, was that, does that mean that, uh, that those Christians there at Jerusalem, that they weren't doing anything to reach the lost, that they were just sitting down and saying, all right, Lord, now you've got to add, so we're just going to wait on you to add. No. No, that's not what they were doing. They were active witnesses. Acts chapter 8 even says later that everywhere they went, they did this. They preached the gospel. Everywhere they went, they were speaking Jesus, preaching Jesus, sharing hope. Uh, Acts 4, Acts 5, Peter, John, all of them had it, having those crowds. Every time they got somebody stand still a few minutes, they told them of Jesus, the mighty to save. They were working. They were witnessing. They were sharing. They were active in the work of the Lord. But it reminds us of this, and I believe that's why it's in the Bible like this. We can work and do anything we want to do. We can have evangelism explosion. We can do CWT. We can do anything we want to do, and we can bombard this community with witness and with tracts and with literature. We can do anything we want to do, but if the Lord doesn't see fit to add to this church, it will not be added to now, I'm going to tell you what I believe, and I don't have a scripture to prove it, but it is my personal conviction that this is why this statement is put in the Bible as it is. I believe that the Lord adds to the church that meets the standard of this passage of scripture. I believe the Lord adds new converts to the congregation that he can trust with them to nurture them and disciple them and grow them up in Jesus. Many modern congregations are in such a spiritual mess themselves as the people of God that the Lord of the harvest cannot entrust to them the teaching of new babies in Christ. That's why we don't see them saved. Folk, one of the things that ought to concern us is if we don't see people regularly being added to the fellowship. One of the things that distinguishes a New Testament church, that's where it ought to be with God, is that lost people are being reached on a regular basis one to faith in Jesus and baptized into the fellowship of the church. Now, this is the norm for the church. This is the standard. This is what the living God says is a portrait of the healthy church that's right with Christ. The membership and the ministry of the body and bride are found here in this place. This is the standard for the membership and for the ministry. Or the words I've used have been the, the, the constituents and the climate of a New Testament church found in this passage of Scripture. This is what Jesus wants His church to be and what He promises it can be if we'll get right with Him individually. If we fall short of this standard of normalcy for God's church, we've got to search out where we're resisting God and yield and submit and surrender and seek Him for cleansing and restoration in that area. Now, I ask you this tonight. Do you see this passage of Scripture lived out in your fellowship? You see these elements? That element of seriousness, the fear of God, that sober, sober reverence. That element of the supernatural wonders and signs, unexplainable things happening as a supernatural God manifests himself. Does that mean everybody's sick gets well? No. Does 
Sometimes God gets greater glory by taking us home. I know that. I, I know that with my grandmother. And you've known it by experience also. But that doesn't negate the fact that the supernatural God of the Bible at times wants to do something supernatural to get glory to himself. That selfless element, giving, not, not hoarding, not saying it's mine, but saying it's ours, it's Christ, and I use it for his honor. That stimulating element, the joy and the gladness, the delight, the excitement. And then the soul winning element where people are on a regular basis, not, not sporadically, but this was a regular routine thing in that church for folks to be getting saved and added to the fellowship. You say, preacher, I'm afraid, I'm afraid there's some areas where we're not measuring up. Well then, you need, to, you need to do this individually because you see the church's reflection of the individual. And so you and I need to say, Lord, I want to be a part of the solution, not a part of the problem. I want to be a plus, not a minus. I believe that Jesus is coming any day. And when he comes, he's coming for the church. And when he comes for the church, the Bible says he's coming for a bride that is robed in white, without spot, without blemish. Now, I know that that speaks of our position in Jesus. There's a sense in which that has to do with our justification. But I believe that you, you and I who are really saved ought to be doing everything in our power to make sure that when Jesus comes, we're living up to what he wants us to be. That when we see him, we don't have to be ashamed. We don't have to be embarrassed at the judgment seat of Christ. But with confidence, we can say, Lord, I did everything I knew to do. I gave everything I knew to give. I surrendered everything I knew to surrender that your word might be real in my life. Not just theoretical of what the church ought to be, but the actual experience of my heart. I believe that this passage of Scripture can be real at Milldale Baptist Church if you and I will turn our heart toward the Lord and seek Him with everything we have. Let's stand together as we pray. My Father, the Word of God convicts and brings me under conviction. Lord, uh, as we look at the church across America, I see very few local congregations even approximating these verses of Scripture. There's such a deadness that's gripped our churches. There's such a lack of life that it's embarrassing. I know it's embarrassing to Jesus who gave his life that we may have life and have it more abundantly. What are we, what are we saying? How, how we are disrespecting the blood of the Lamb by not experiencing the abundant life he died to give us. Nobody's being saved. Our baptistries are dry. We go for weeks and months and nobody's gotten saved. And the worst thing is we don't seem to care. We're just going through our routine, having our little church services. I pray, Father, for a breaking. I pray you'd crush us and reduce us. I ask you to create a desperation within our heart that sees revival not just as a good thing, but as the essential for our survival. And Father, may you begin tonight working a work of transformation in we individually, we Christians individually, and then collectively in our church families. Do what you have to tonight to get us where we ought to be. Be as drastic as you have to be. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Let's sing a verse 2 invitation, brother. It may be that there's some who feel conviction before God and realize that there's some things not right in their own life, and they'd like to come to the altar and deal with it. If that's the case, you can do it. You've got a few moments to do so. Brother Jimmy, if you'd come. Brother Jimmy's here praying. You may need just to join him. Or if you need someone to talk to, I'll talk with you, Brother Mac, other folks around. As we wait on you, you, you let the Lord have his way. Go ahead, brother. Hey. 